ambitious, uh, changing people's lives, which means like you have a mission to do something impactful, um, and doing it as a great team. And so someone needs to be able to demonstrate that they're going to care about those things, so that they're going to be effective within the team setting. Um, another aspect is just being able to communicate effectively. Um, but beyond that, I think what we also very much value is uh, being able to demonstrate that you can, for example, uh, you have in the past uh, been able to make yourself vulnerable and have the ability to say, I don't know. But that is actually very, very important for us. Uh, we also have a high kind of uh, value based on transparency. So being able to demonstrate that you're comfortable working in that environment and that uh, you're not just going to uh, say, oh, I know how to do it and then go in your own direction or try to kind of you know, create a little black box that you operate in. Um, but yeah, those are kind of some of the soft skills that we Can you launch uh, an internship program for uh, students not experienced people? So um, the way we're going about doing that is um, we're thinking about it in terms of steps. And so right now, we just completed our first step, which was let's validate that we can get a small group of senior experienced people to deliver that first success. As we think about the next steps moving forward, we recognize that we have a, 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 a need and really a responsibility to start developing some of those talents within kind of service type, as in not just expect people are going to come in and from day one be able to do everything we need them to do, and that we're going to be the ones that kind of provide that training and that uh, career path. Um, that obviously takes time, and so as we go through kind of our iterations, then the time horizon that we work within is going to get longer and longer. So we've started doing some curriculum and some training on some of the specific areas of technology as kind of a first step. Um, but what I would expect is, assuming that we're able to continue the momentum that we've built so far, that we will increase the scope of our kind of programs that we have. So I suspect we'll start doing internships with universities. We'll probably collaborate on perhaps running some of the classes and there's probably a whole list of opportunities that we can discuss about how service type can interact with the universities and open up some of these uh, programs to the, the, the wider population. Uh, but our approach has always been to uh, take very concrete, specific steps with very clearly identified success criteria. Because I personally believe it's a mistake to try to do everything all at once in the first step. And so our goal is to eventually get to a place where we're making the biggest possible impact, but to do that within kind of gated uh, steps in the process. So uh, also maybe you can speak to what our current plans are for any sort of internships, and if you don't have one, that's okay too. But what, what do we currently have planned in terms of availability? So currently we're still aiming to grow our senior engineering team to between 15 to 20 people. So only after that we would be able to absorb more uh, less senior people because it's also a re uh, high responsibility when you're taking on interns so that you don't just take them and have them sit there but you're taking on the responsibility to coach them. So we want to first make sure we have the necessary capacity before we take on that. I think we are currently looking at about at least half a year until we can reach that point. And currently we are also actively organizing trainings to help people actually also to, for the mid ones to reach the senior level so that we can hire them now. So that's another approach. And <clears throat> so this is the very first training we have organized now. It's going to be finished in about three to four weeks. And based on the results of the feedbacks, so we want to start thinking about what we do. Do we repeat that? Do we grow that? Do we do another even more difficult one? So, uh, I'm sure if you just follow our Facebook uh, service type in Armenia Facebook page, so we're posting all this news there. So. so, has anyone here tr uh, considered applying or tried to apply? Yeah, I tried. What position? Uh, first one was pure engineering, 
Okay? Um, do you have any experience with QL automation? Yeah, so. uh, don't take it personal, it's just, uh, <laughs> we just have uh, some requirements. So but we appreciate the answers. I'll ask a question I'm teaching uh, interaction design uh, here. I'm wondering what, uh, you know, what specialists you have in uh, user experience design, interaction design abroad, and whether you're thinking of uh, kind of getting some here and having some work from here, or? Yeah, good question. So, in terms of what we have on the design side today, um, we have a design team of, I think, somewhere between 15 to 20 designers. Um, and what we found to be effective for us is we initially started thinking about it in terms of let's break out UI versus UX and kind of do it in a collaborative model. Uh, what we found is that designers don't always get along, <laughs> and that proved to be very difficult. And so we've kind of changed our model to think about it from a kind of an end-to-end -end, uh, skill set. And so now we look for people that can uh, not just do the UX piece, but be able to go the full distance and uh, understand kind of the full scope. Uh, so that's kind of the profile that we optimize for today. Um, in terms of Armenia, um, the team that we're trying to stand up right now to have that autonomy is trying to solve a problem where there's some design aspects, but it's not really a design heavy problem. It's really around support automation and things like that. So I don't know if we're going to actually have a design role for this kind of specific iteration. Uh, but as we get to kind of teams that have more autonomy around things that are, you know, have a user interface, then I suspect that we do looking for design resources as well. Um, so that's kind of at the high level. But, you know, so much of the success that we've had has been a function of our design, and we place a very high value on having kind of that, that I think is super critical, just independent of service type, I think for the local ecosystem to be successful, that has to be a muscle that's developed. And it's a very, very, you know, uh, on the surface, it, the people think design is about making stuff pretty, and it's absolutely not what design is about. And so, uh, I think it's it's great that you guys are focusing on that and having that be a, a, a piece of the curriculum. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's in terms of building great technology, uh, design, you know, it's critical. Do you? Employ data scientists, and uh, what are your plans <coughs> in this area? Yeah, so uh, funny you should mention that. Actually, one of our hires here today, who's in our data science team, who's a graduate from AUA, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so it, at a high level, yes, we actually have a few teams uh, that we kind of employ data science towards. Uh, we have a team that. Uh, I think today we've got something in the neighborhood of six or seven data scientists uh, within the product organization. And uh, we also have a team that's kind of an internal operations team where they essentially are, are again, uh, apply data science to our own you know, customer acquisition efforts and our internal finance and forecasting and all those kinds of things. Um, long term, the vision is to essentially embed um, machine learning and artificial intelligence in every aspect of the product, and that's kind of what we're gearing up to do. Mm -hmm. um, and right now we're in the phase where we're still trying to set up some of the basic infrastructure you need, the data pipelines, the training infrastructure, um, the, the design elements of it. You know, like if you think about how that technology is used, uh, a piece of it is about making predictions and, and incorporating that. But a piece of it is also the automation of uh, taking over a certain functionality that today is done by a human and having the machine do it. Well, one of the biggest challenges in doing that is not only in having the thing actually work in terms of making the right decisions, but also communicating with the user about why it's making the decision that it's making and getting that trust to then hand over that decision. And that's actually a design challenge as much as it is a uh, data science challenge. Mm -hmm. And so 
as we think about what is it going to take to get from where we are today to kind of an ideal future state where anything that can be automated is automated and you have you know, this uh, machine learning aspect of it. Uh, we think that one of the bigger challenges is just winning that trust. So today, what we really focus on is what is that interaction with the user going to be like in order to get them to actually hand over that power or make decisions. You know, for example, uh, we have this feature within Service Titan that we call Smart Dispatch that automatically assigns a uh, which technician should be assigned to which job. Uh, and on the surface, you know, like our customers today spend literally hundreds of millions of dollars on payroll paying someone to do that job. And we have this tool that they literally can flip the switch and it automates it. The vast majority of them don't use it. Why? Because they don't trust it. They, they have very uh, few ways right now to know that this is the actual right decision. And so in that very specific example, in order to get the full adoption of that feature and the full value of it, it's actually a, a challenge in gaining that trust. And so now we're thinking about ways of, okay, what should the UI and UX be of how this thing is turned on? What is the right way of communicating to the user why this decision is better than what the human would have done and so forth? And so uh, it, it's an area that's, that we're heavily investing in internally. I can tell you that it's one of the hottest fields in tech broadly. Uh, it's one of the hardest positions to find. And if, if you know, you're in a position where you've got kind of the math background and, and the ambition to go into that field, it's an incredibly lucrative field. And it's probably got one of the highest potentials in terms of, uh, you know, within engineering, broadly speaking, and certainly within the broader job market. Uh, so uh, it's, it's um, very happy that there's a focus both here at the university and it seems like even broadly at the country level as well. Um, and I think it's going to be one of the big drivers of the future just in terms of tech as a whole. Mm -hmm. Can you describe the uh, service to turn on how it's working in services? Sure. So uh, I'll talk about kind of how the company was created. So I was at the I was at university. I was about to graduate, and my uh, my dad he he's a plumber. In fact, he's probably under a house right now fixing something. Uh, and he had a plumbing business that he was running. And I saw the tool he was using to track his customers, the jobs, the invoices, and like it was like from the 80s, green screen, no mouse, like it was just bad. And so I thought, Dad, like course, using the wrong stuff, when I'll just go Google and I'll find something to replace this system he was using to run his business. And when I looked around, I was like, man, everything sucks. There's no good products out there. So I figured, okay, I'll spend a few weeks, I'll put something together, and then I'll go be an engineer at Google or something. And so I started kind of tinkering and building it, and then, you know, a few weeks turned into a few months, and then I kind of realized, oh, this is actually much deeper and more complex problem than I originally recognized. And that's kind of the beginning of the company. And then I met my co-founder who was working on a very similar problem. And we just kind of started the company there. But to answer your question, what we do is we provide a tool that's used by companies that provide services in the home. So um, if you, let's just say you have a plumbing company in Texas and you have 10 trucks that you then send out and they do services in people's homes. The way you service Titan is you service Titan to do all your marketing analytics so you understand every advertisement that you put money into, what is that yielding in terms of an ROI. We do all the call center management so when the customer calls in, the agent uses our system to answer the phone, to capture the customer's information, to give them history, to book the job. Then somebody uses service Titan to figure out which technician goes to, to which house. Then when the technicians get into home, they use service Titan to do their inspections, put together the options, charge for the payment, apply for financing, and then when they, you know, that cycle repeats for all the jobs. And then the back office, all of the invoices, the payroll, the receivables, the accounting integrations, all of that happens in Service Titan. And so the value that we bring to our customers is that we take all these various things that needs to get done for any business, we put it all in one package, 
And that's kind of where the value creation happens. Because what we discovered is that just like my dad, this entire industry is full of people that are not technical. So, for example, at Service Titan, you know, we've got hundreds of engineers and we have all of these things, and we're able to implement Salesforce and put on marketing automation and put on some forecasting software and accounting and do all the technical integrations and make sure the data is flowing and blah, blah, blah. Well, these businesses can't do that. And so while there were solutions out there that were point solutions that were marketing analytics solutions or call center management or whatever, the big piece that was missing is nobody had taken these pieces, put them together, and put it on the internet so that it was accessible. All our competitors were kind of old legacy systems that were more Windows-based and so forth. So that's what we do. We're a tool that's used by businesses. Uh, we don't actually interface with customers. And in fact, most people look at us and they're like, oh, you're like an Uber for plumbers. And like, that, that's not what we are at all. We don't inter we're not a marketplace where we connect consumers to the thing. Uh, we're like a back-end tool that's used by these companies to run their business. So that engineer? Yeah. <laughs> That'd be embarrassing. Sure. Right? <laughs> yeah. And but well, it's all on the cloud. It's all service cloud. software yeah. as a service. Yeah. So they pay as they use. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just to give you a sense on the business side, uh, if you look at the average service type of customer and look at what they were paying their previous supplier or their previous vendor, we are at a minimum three hundred percent more expensive, and many times we're even higher. You know. 10 times more expensive is not uncommon. In fact, we had one customer, this is the most extreme example, he went from paying $600 a month to his previous provider to $30,000 a month to service them. Why? Because we're able to demonstrate to him that using Service Titan, he's able to make more money because you know we make his marketing a little bit better and we make his call center a little bit better and we make his performance in the field a little bit better. And what ends up happening is the impact compounds on each other. So the top of the funnel, the middle of the funnel, the bottom of the funnel. And we're able to demonstrate that as a business, if you, if, if you uh, the way we communicate to our customers is, look, we're going to create this much value for you, and we're going to take this much in return back to us. And as long as that ROI exists, the pricing conversation is around the value creation. And so we never competed on price. That was never our strategy. That will never be our strategy. We will always be the most expensive product out there. As long as we create the most value, then it still makes business sense for our customers. And I think, you know, when I talk to Armenian startups here and just kind of the uh, community here, the, the default is always, let's try to do the same thing that the competitors are doing and go cheaper. And in my opinion, well, obviously like for Amazon and everything and Walmart, sure, that's a strategy that works very well a lot of the time. But when you're talking about technology, building a technology business, that's not always the right way to go. That's certainly not the way that we went. Uh, what we find is that a lot of the companies today that are being successful are focusing more on value creation and creating as much value as possible. And then you try to just charge as much money as you possibly can. And that's kind of an iterative process and you're going to experiment and test. Uh, so it's not always clear kind of what the pricing is. We still don't understand what the right price should be. We just kind of try and see if it works. And sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but we're a tool that's used by these businesses and we charge by user. So for every user they have on the system, um, you know, they pay us money and that's how it works. Are your customers more big companies, service companies, or very individual farmers? Yeah, good question. So if you were to look at kind of home services as a whole, there's, in the U.S., um, roughly about a million businesses that exist within home services. Within that group, we today only serve companies that do plumbing, HVAC, and electrical, companies that are focused on service, not new construction, companies that are focused on residential customers instead of commercial, and companies that have uh, five employees or more. And so when you do that, you go from about a million potential customers to 30,000. Potential customers. And even though we're a billion dollar company today and so on, we still today only focus on the 30,000. So if you came to us today and you were a one truck plumbing shop, we don't even let you get on the software. We just say no, <coughs> it's not going to work. Because we know that we're not a good fit for those guys today. 
that the product is too big, they don't get the value from it. And we haven't figured out a way yet to make that work for them. So within the industry that we serve, we're known as the ones that serve the top end of the market. But because the market is a fragment of highly small, all our customers are still small businesses. Like our biggest, biggest customer maybe does 100 million a year, which is still considered a small business in the US. It's still like a family owned type of thing. So we don't sell to the Fortune 500. None of our customers are public and so on and so forth. It, from a category perspective, we're still focused on SMBs. But within our market, we service the bigger end and the ones that are generally the larger ones. But we don't go any smaller than five employees today. That's one of the areas that we're looking at for growth potentially. And so via, for, your, for your growth, you could, I assume you're focused on the US right now. Like you said, there's a huge market. Um, and so you could grow in terms of just broadening into other segments. Mm -hmm. Or another approach for growth is to start growing internationally. Sure. How are you guys um, thinking about yeah. those choices? Yeah, great question. So, the if you think about just in terms of growth, like well, what is good and what is bad, generally the gold standard that kind of tech companies aspire to today is it's the it's called a two T three D, and what that means is you first you need to get to a million a year of revenue. That's just baseline. Once you get to a million a year revenue, you do triple, triple, double, double, double. So when you do the math, that gets you to 72 million in five years. So we went through more than that. Today we're roughly about 100 million a year in revenue. And our goal is to continue growing at roughly 100% a year. So that's kind of the top down goal that we have. So we want to maintain this trajectory going forward. So then the next question becomes how? How do you do that? And I, it doesn't matter how big you are. Even Google and Microsoft and all of these guys, they all at the end of the day have this much opportunity to do stuff and this much capacity to do it. That, that's a universal problem. And so then that means, okay, so of all the opportunities there, where do you invest? It's a fundamental resource allocation problem. And so for us, when we think about our growth, it, we, there's a few different vectors involved. So just going back to that initial sizing, out of the 30,000 customers, today we're roughly about 10%. So our number one growth vector is just within our home base. Just continue that growth of maybe becoming, we think it, we can easily be 60%, 70% market share, just given the dynamics of the market. So that's kind of goal number one, is win within the home space. Beyond that, the additional vectors of growth are essentially, if you think about that, uh, what we call our ideal client profile, uh, plumbing HVAC, service not new construction, residential not commercial, five technicians and above. Well, if you loosen any of these constraints, then you have additional vectors for growth. And the exercise that we're going through right now is essentially we have an entire team of like, I don't know, 15 people now that just focus on this problem, we're trying to understand what is that right next incremental step? So is it to go into roofing and windows and lawn care? Or is it to go into commercial services where they're servicing businesses? Or is it to go into new construction where they're building entire tracts of homes? Or is it to go to Europe or to China? Or for us, what we found is that because we're like that end-to-end -end operating system, we're able to develop new products and sell for existing customers. So for example, uh, a few years ago, we realized that all of our customers need to process payments. And so we're like, oh, we, we can do that. And so we made a payments product. And uh, we realized that because we have this operating system that these companies are using, we can do things that no other payment processor can do. So for example, we keep the technician within our app so the user experience is better. They don't have to switch to a different app. We can attach the payment to the invoice. So that's a step that nobody else can do because they don't have access to the invoice. We can know when the money goes into the bank what payments were there so we can automate the process of doing the deposit and the reconciliation and so forth. And so because there was all these opportunities for value creation, we were able to be basically impossible to compete with. If you're running on service type, it makes no sense not to use service type for your payments. So that's why we charge more for our payments than the rest of the competition does. We have 
I think today something like 80% of our customers using our payments product, and we charge probably like 20, 30% more than the other payment providers. And why do our customers do, choose to do business with us? Well, because we create more value than anybody else does. And so the other growth factor for us is investing and building in products that we can then sell to our existing customer base. So when we take a step back and think about, okay, the high level goal is to continue growing at 100% for the next few years. Uh, then, you know, it becomes an exercise in optimization, right? This is the universe of possibilities for us to invest in. This is how many resources we have. I mean, and even after, you know, raising 300 million and having 700 employees, for us, it's still not enough. Like, there's still way more opportunities than we have to invest for. And so we're figuring it out as we go along right now. Are most of the students here in engineering? Probably computer science, some engineering, maybe odds and ends, others. Got it, yeah. If, if you computer you, science engineering, so. Yeah, well, I mean, in our, yeah. sorry, just to, to, to free, If you had a piece of advice to students now, mm -hmm. like, take this class, or spend your summer doing that, or uh, anything, yeah. free advice, one time only. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, what advice, what might you advise to, you know, bachelor's or master's students in those fields? Yeah. Uh, I mean, this may sound kind of cheesy, but I'd say the first piece of advice is know yourself. Like, try to understand what you really, really want and what's important to you. Because uh, I think that is the starting point of any sort of like big life decisions. Uh, for me, I always knew that I, I needed to be really successful. Like, that was really important to me, and I kind of knew that, you know, frankly speaking, I really, really wanted to be. I wanted to make my parents proud of me. I wanted to be rich. I wanted to make an impact. And so that by itself eliminated a whole set of possibilities because that was really, really important and I knew that I needed to have that for me to be content with myself. And, but that had a bunch of consequences. Like, it's not easy to start a business. There's all sorts of hardships along the way. And I made a conscious decision early on that I was gonna sacrifice a whole bunch of things and I knew I was gonna have to work really hard to get there. That might not make sense for everyone. In fact, for sure it doesn't make sense for everyone. So I think first step is just understanding what's important to you and being realistic about what that means. Uh, in terms of tactically what that looks like once you go from there, I would say, generally speaking, technical skills are super, super important. So being able to, like, the specifics within that, I think statistics is incredibly useful just across the field. Uh, there was one class I, had, I took in school which I absolutely hated when I was taking it. In fact, I dropped my business major because of this class, it was accounting. And I, I hated it so much, I remember thinking, I would rather dig ditches for a living than ever do accounting. Today, there's probably no class that I've ever taken that's as useful as accounting is. I use it every single day. Uh, so I think accounting is super, super important if you're gonna do anything in business. Um, and then, just on the technical side, um, I, I really value SQL skills in, in my interviews. I think being able to process data, just even for a product manager or, or, or anyone, that's, that, that's uh, really useful. But you know, anything beyond that is really specific to the path that you want to go down. Uh, and one of the things I really recommend people do is to really paint this image in their mind of where is it they want to end up. And then just go look at what people want, right? It's not a mystery, <coughs> this is not some big secret that companies are trying to hide. If you wanna be a data scientist, go pull up all the job descriptions of data scientists. Look at what they're actually looking for. If you wanna you know, be a designer, then go see what kind of experiences are valued, what are some of the skill sets that are necessary. When they describe in the job description what, who they're looking for, you'll be able to understand what those, those gaps are. And then, of course, I'm partial to kind of computer science and engineering. So anytime, like, family members or anybody seek for advice, I'm like, go learn computer science. Like, just, just trust me, go, go, go learn it. So I think if that's something that is exciting to people, it's certainly kind of a, a very, very useful uh, skill set. And I don't know anyone that's graduated computer science and is a programmer that can't find a job and is, isn't able to make money fairly easily. So that's how great Thank you. Yeah, you know, there's often 
discussion uh, in the university. Often students want practical courses. They don't too theoretical, too theoretical. They want practical courses. And in fact, if a student looks at job descriptions as you describe it, they'll say you need to know C programming, you need to know this, this, this. But you know, uh, things change in, in the real world. Yep. And I'm of the opinion that vigorous, solid training in some of the theories is yep. essential for people to succeed long term and also have leadership positions. Uh, you know, I, I often give this example. California has a marvelous education system because they have planned it so well. There is the junior college, then there's Cal State system, then there's the UC system. Many companies prefer Cal State graduates because they're practical, they hire them, they immediately know the codes, they know the language, the programming. But 10 years later you come, that guy is still doing the same. Yep. You see graduates who are stronger in theory, they may not be immediately usable in terms of the practical needs, but they come back 10 years, 20 years later, they are the leaders. Yep. They are the ones that are able to adapt to new needs sure. in the industry, quickly learn new stuff and, and follow. And when you're a student, you don't see that long term. You see the immediate. So, for example, our students would complain that there's not enough program. Because when you go to work, the programming is the first thing they do. Yep. So why do I need all that math? Why do I need the statistics? What's your view on this? Yeah, good question. So, um, if we were talking about this earlier, actually. Um, so I, I have a bit of a controversial view on this. Um, I would push back on the premise of the question. So I would say, from an employer's perspective, when we're looking at assessing candidates, certainly skill sets is obviously one of the things that you look for. But the way I think many employers, and I doubt many of them would admit this, they also think of it in terms of a proxy for intelligence, a proxy for work ethic, and so forth. And so, for example, when I see an applicant come in who's gone to Harvard or Stanford or whatever the case may be, even if they didn't learn anything while they were at Stanford and they were, took some random class that had nothing to do with what we are hiring them for, just the fact that they got into Stanford is already a huge signal. That tells me that this person already has a lot to offer. So I think, in some ways, the university, the badge that you have on that university is really a signal to what filter you were able to pass through just to get in. And then the skills that you learn in the process, I think, in many ways are almost secondary to that kind of filter aspect. Now, in terms of the conversation between the practical aspect and the theoretical aspect, like, you know, I went to USC, which is one of the, the better uh, engineering schools in the country, and we can debate whether the UCs are better than USC. Some UCs are probably better. But like when we were learning programming, it was still probably two or three languages behind what the current state was, and it was very much theoretical. And so like when we hire an engineer out of school, we're expecting to have to train them on our specific technologies and all those kinds of things. And, Sure, it would be great if they had the latest language that they learned, but part of the value that we see in someone who has a computer science degree is they know how the whole thing works. And, and they can go from the CPU and the registers and all the commands to the assembly language to the higher level languages and they understand compilers and operating systems. And so that theoretical depth gives them a lot of power to then be able to incorporate new things so that when the next language comes out, they have a head start. So I think there's tremendous value in the theory aspect of it. I think the question becomes, are we teaching the right theories and are those the most relevant? Because it could also go in the other direction where they don't necessarily have the relevant areas. So I agree with you to the extent that it shouldn't be like a trade school where you're just focusing on the skill sets that you need for the job market and that's it. Because there's certain things that don't even come to play until you're years into it and so forth. 
the right balance between those two? I have no idea. This is not my domain, and I don't claim to have an answer for that. But I think there needs to be consideration of both sides. And going to the extreme of either the end, it doesn't make sense either. Uh, but in terms of the, you know, from the employer perspective, uh, it's, it, it would be difficult for me to, to not mention kind of the, the branching aspect of it as well. And so in Armenia, obviously, AUA is uh, one of the, if not the premier brand to have. And people should see the value of that. And, and that should be part of consideration as well. Uh, but I don't think the students here should necessarily complain that the, the language that they're learning is not the latest or whatever because it changes so fast, right? If you think about what a university has to do to set up a curriculum, to have everything in place, you would expect there to be some delay. Hopefully it's not too big of a delay between what the latest is and so forth. Um, but I, I, would, I would agree to the sense that the theory is definitely important, and there's certain core kind of like math, like incredibly important, because it expresses itself in all sorts of things in engineering. But to your point, it's not going to be easy to necessarily recognize, oh, this linear algebra algebra class is going to be useful in this programming job because it's, it's not that direct of a connection. So I wouldn't discount the theory at all. But I think there needs to be consideration of growth, and especially in an environment like Armenia where the ecosystem isn't as mature and you know there's a lot of different companies looking for different things. There's probably a higher burden on the universities to maybe focus on those practical skills that could accelerate the ramp up and so forth. Uh, but it shouldn't be at the expense of the pure here. And uh, like I said, I think it's gonna be a balance as the right answer, not necessarily one versus the other. I'm gonna have to steal Vahe away, so we can probably do one more question. The last three questions I can ask for the <laughs> Maybe regarding entrepreneurship. Um, sure. So uh, there are several people uh, here that are teaching courses related to entrepreneurship. And as you may know, we have an entrepreneurship for the innovation center at AMA, which has to help with, with the next uh, generation of entrepreneurs. Yep. Um, maybe a simple question, but uh, what would you advise us on what, what aspects should we kind of uh, focus so that, you know, we get the best, like the most uh, of what we actually offer to, to, to people we work with. Yeah, good question. Um, I think, you know, if I think about from an entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship perspective, what's really important, um, to me, it really is some of the very basics about, like, why do companies exist? Why, why are some businesses successful and why some businesses aren't successful? And to me, it really comes down to um, value creation and just solving problems. So I, uh, I've interacted with a lot of the startups here in, in the local ecosystem, and I think a couple of the things that stand out to me as being areas for improvement or opportunity. Um, one is that there's in my opinion, not as much emphasis in understanding the problem that they're trying to solve, or even understanding if it's a problem we're, we're, we're solving. So just the idea of being able to like, think, I would say if there's one principle that should be being hammered home in any entrepreneurship class, is that you should start with the premise that you don't know, that you're starting from scratch, and that you should validate every one of your assumptions, that you should be thinking about where you are today, where you want to go, and all the risk factors involved, and have a methodical process about doing them. So like, there's this book called Lean Startup by, by Eric Weiss. That's like, it, 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 it's, it's very effective in communicating like this kind of idea that I'm talking about. So just having an iterative approach to the process, to me has a ton of value. And because what I've seen here, and this is a mistake everyone, I've made the same mistake too. A lot of times entrepreneurs will come in and they'll have this vision of what they want, and they'll lock themselves in a room just building this masterpiece that they're gonna be like, ta-da, and then everything's gonna happen. That's not how the world works. And so I think breaking that and thinking about how you can set people up for success and not falling into that trap is, is a big aspect of it. Uh, the other one that probably comes a little bit later is around fundraising. So, um, you know, we've raised, you know, we raised two seed rounds and four venture rounds, uh, and it was like, First one was 200,000, 400,000, and 18 million, and the number just got really big after that. And one of the things that I think we did really effectively 
was the common approach, and we did this early on too, is you try to figure out what do investors want, and then you kind of you know, try to make yourself appeal, or you, you think about what are some of the tactics I can do, how do I get in front of investors, how do I do this and how do I do that. And I think fundamentally that approach is flawed, because if you look at the, the current circumstance, there's way, way more capital that is looking for investment opportunities than there are good investment opportunities. So it's a huge advantage to the entrepreneur. Uh, the problem is, how do you get access to that? And in my opinion, the, the question shouldn't be solved from a, hey, what are the tactics I can do to raise money? It really should be solved from a perspective of like, how can I make the money chase me? How can I get myself to be uh, the buyer of the transaction and not the seller? Because uh, that, that's where you win. That's where you get the leverage. That's where you get the valuation. That's how you get that. And so if the question is, how do you become the buyer in that fundraising transaction? Then you just need to understand like what's important to the investor. And in today's world, I'll diverge for just a second. Thirty years ago, um, or twenty years ago, or whatever, in order to start a business, it took a lot of capital. So, like, if I, if I wanted to start service time in the nineties, I would have to buy a bunch of computers to host all this stuff. The technology to build it would have been ten times harder because a lot of the tools hadn't been built yet. So, the amount of capital I would need to do service type would have been much more. But I could have gone in, I could be like, I have this idea. And then people would go, oh great, here's some money, go make this idea. That is not the world we live in today. What's happened since then is the costs have gone way down. There's all sorts of cloud services now that I, I only pay when I use it. The tools necessary have advanced tremendously where what used to take 100 hours might take five hours a day to do. But what that's done to the fundraising aspect is it's raised the ball. And then you can no longer come to an investor and be like, I have an idea, and they'll give you money. No, you need to come to an investor and you need to be much more mature along the journey. And if that trend is gonna continue. 10 years from now, it's gonna be even harder in terms of what stage you need to be in to raise the money. But conversely, it's going to be much easier to then get to that stage. You should rest require less money. So in today's world, to raise money, what you really need is traction. You need to be able to demonstrate not just that you have the idea, not just that you have the competency and the capability of making that idea into a real product, but that your product is actually gaining traction and that you have users that are willing to either pay you or use your product or whatever. And so that's the, the area where I think entrepreneurs need to focus on. And if you can get to the right level of traction, the money will come. Like there's there's, enti there's an entire city, that's all they do is look for opportunities to invest in companies. The question is, what are you doing to put yourself in a position to be part of that, that magic? And so uh, what I find a lot of, and this is not just here, I, I see this in the US as well. A lot of the entrepreneurs are just focused on I need to raise money, I need to raise money, I need to have this meeting, I need to have that meeting. And the process of raising money creates no value for the business. Every minute that you spend on raising money is a minute that you steal from making the business better. So the other kind of main point that would kind of hammer on to the entrepreneurship side is don't focus on raising the money. Focus on creating a reason for the money to come to you. And then once you do that, like it's much easier to get access to the capital. Those are the areas that I'll focus on. I can I just make a quick statement. So, um, many of you may know, Vahe was here a year ago and gave a talk. And his talk was more about the business and how the business started. And it was very inspirational. So, I just want to thank you for what you're doing. Um, you're inspiring all of us. Um, in our courses, I teach entrepreneurship. Service Titan is an example of a business that we talk about in our course. Um, at the same time, we know that you didn't have to come to Armenia. We know probably you had to convince your board to do it. Even you spending a week here is an opportunity cost for your company. And so just as an Armenian and from AUA, really want to thank what you and Ada are doing. And it's very inspirational. It's very important. 
And I think a lot of people appreciate it. You guys are a very early stage company. There are so many other things you could do. I'm just doing this at this stage of your company is really amazing and very laudatory. So thank you. And your comments were very really insightful. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you all.